And so to finish up here, uh, obviously you've got um, kind of two parts of your brain right now, I almost think of, right? You've got the the medical side and the training that you've done there. Uh, and obviously the hours and hours that you've spent kind of looking at this um, and starting to identify some of the potential solutions. But then you also are uh, an investor and you're managing capital and, and things like that. Where's the crossover in terms of how do you see uh, coronavirus and the economic impact um, kind of continuing over uh, across different markets uh, in the coming weeks and months? Yeah, so it's constantly changing, but I think you have to kind of look out for three different potential paths uh, coming up over the next few months or years. So there's the first path where we do find a medication, a treatment, or a prophylactic that can flatten the curve, reduce the symptoms, reduce the fatality rate, or reduce the number of people that get infected. And that could buy us time until maybe a vaccine is developed, or even until we have herd immunity and this thing in coronavirus just becomes almost like the flora of the seasonal flu and not really a big deal. The second uh, path is the virus mutates a little bit. So almost like H1N1, uh, where it was a, kind of thought it was a big deal, a higher fatality rate. And then it kind of mutated in a way where a lot of people got it. So it was affected a lot of people, but the mortality was actually quite low. So that's why it didn't even hit the radar all that much. And most people don't even know how many people are actually infected by it. Um, and then the third path would be if the virus does not mutate, if it, uh, we do not have a medication or vaccine for it, then that's scarier, obviously. And what I think you could be looking at is maybe, and this is based off China and South Korea, how their cases have stabilized. Their number of new cases is dramatically dropping. That is this have to do with the warmer weather coming in? And are we going to see a second wave come the fall? And that's what a lot of people compare this to the Spanish flu of 1918, where it had its first wave that kind of ended around June, July. And it wasn't until about October, November, the second wave came in. And that's the one that really wiped out a lot of people. And so that's something that you're going to be looking out for is if this does settle down, that's great. That's fantastic. But keeping a close eye for reinfections in areas um, come the fall. On a short term basis, um, for Americans, look at Italy. We're running about 10 days behind Italy. So what Italy is going through now will be America most likely in 10 days. And this just seems so obvious to me over the past couple of weeks. Um, and so that's why it was interesting. A couple of weeks ago, almost no one was really talking about Corona. It was almost like a joke. Um, and you were, it was awkward if you weren't shake someone's hand or something. Now it, it's not. And if you actually just look at those stories coming out of Italy about the people living there, what that life is like, prepare for that. Because that could easily be America. Uh, in 10 days. And I think it's already getting very close to that. And so looking for uh, stabilization of coronavirus, again, look at Italy. When those cases stop going up and st stabilize, I think that's good news. And I think that there's hope for the stabilizing, at least over the summer, and then we'll have to revisit it in the fall. And then I think Got the it. market, so Bitcoin and Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, I think that all kind of goes in, in something this massive. It seems like it kind of is uh, trading along with it. When the economy is going down, it's it's you know, a risk on asset and it goes down as well. Um. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I've heard, and I don't know if it's true or not, um, is that once you get coronavirus, uh, you basically can't get reinfected, right? So the population itself, some portion could get infected, it goes away and comes back and could reinfect other people. But is it true that the individual itself, once you have it, um, you can't get it again, or is it just too early to know whether that's uh, accurate or not? So that's typically how viruses work. Once you get a viral infection, you can't get that really exact same viral infection. Um, there can be different strains of it, though. That's why you can get the flu in multiple years. It's not like you get the flu once and you're not, you never get the flu again. Another strain can come out the next year, or you might get affected with a different strain even that year. Um, they are finding, though, that they are find patients that test negative after they've been treated later than test positive again for the virus. And so that's concerning in some ways in the thought that are they not treating patients long enough? Is this some type of reinfection? Um, and so that, that, that's, that, that uh, data is being studied now. But um, I'm inclined to think that's how you get herd, herd immunity is potentially as you, if you get infected, you won't get it again. So that's kind of the hope, but it's not definitive at this point. 
Got it. And, and those different strains, I think the other thing I've heard is basically when the warm weather comes, it may kind of migrate south uh, to South America, Latin America, et cetera. Uh, but there could be mutations. And then when the cold weather returns later this year, uh, North America, for example, um, that's where really uh, there could be some problems because now you're not just talking about uh, the coronavirus, but there could be multiple sh uh, strains of this or, or kind of mutations um, that even if you already had it, you're still susceptible to, to the new stuff. Yeah, exactly. I think that uh, one thing that people argue that for going away during the summer is increased temperature will dry out the, the virus in some ways. And then also the increased humidity. So it's kind of like you have this heat kind of sun drying effect. But then you also have the humidity in the air, which will uh, stop the spread of the virus. Because if there's enough air, water particles in the air, it'll stop the, the viral particles from kind of you know projecting when you talk or sneeze or cough. Got it. No, it's super interesting. Um, okay. And then what do you think is kind of the, uh, if you had a guess right now, what, what does this look like uh, over the next kind of six to eight weeks? Do we flatten the curve, you know, two weeks from now and, um, and, and kind of start moving back towards, uh, you know, everyday life? Do we stay in kind of this self quarantined, um, you know, even in some places shelter in place for, for weeks, months? Like, how do you think this plays out given the information you have today? Uh, you're going to be quarantined for at least weeks. I would say at least a month. It could be a couple months, three months. It kind of depends on this thesis on this thing slowing down for the summer. But I think we're in for a rocky few weeks uh, coming up. And uh, it looked like Italy was stabilizing a little bit, but then they recorded a record number of new cases yesterday and another record number it looks like today. So it's it, we haven't had any, uh, there's been no evidence this is slowing down really for Italy or Europe. And so that that's not good news for us right now either. Got it. And then what do you take um, in terms of uh, China? I think today we're recording on a, on Thursday, uh, March 19th. Um, it was either yesterday or today they reported no new cases. So, you know, quote unquote, zero new cases. Uh, can we trust the data? You know, how, how do you kind of fit that data point into this whole thing? So I'm in contact with people that have come back from China and they feel convinced that China has it under control and that that data is real. That's always been the question, though, is from the very beginning. You know, China didn't really want to announce that this was the virus. You had the whistleblowers that were originally persecuted and now praised. And so there is this always this distrust of the information from China. But South Korea has a kind of very positive results. I think Singapore has been doing a good job controlling this. Um, and so it's, it's possible. It's also possible on the uh, kind of social infrastructure side of things. I think uh, in China and, and South Korea, you know, the social distancing is maybe a lot easier or if the government recommends it or imposes it, it's done much more effectively. Whereas in Italy and the U.S., you know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, screw that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm going to go kiss whoever's cheek I want, I'm gonna go to the bars. And so I think that it really takes a little bit more to scare people. And now people are starting to get scared where maybe they're scaling back on that a little bit. But if you read a lot of the Italians, what they're telling Americans right now is do that now. Don't don't wait until it gets so bad that you, you know, there's a curfew, you can't, you have, if you're outside, like in, China, in Italy right now, if you go outside, you have to essentially have a pass or a very good evidence or reason for being out. Otherwise you get fined. And the only reason you're really allowed to go out is to go to pick up medication or to go to grocery stores. Yeah. I, the other thing I just saw um, literally right before we started recording, uh, and again, so I'll caveat with, I, I haven't had the time to look at the accuracy of it, is um, Israel is actually implementing uh, martial law. Um, so like yeah. actual true martial law where the, the government uh, or the military is going to enforce people staying inside, curfews, you know, all of this kind of non-essential traffic, et cetera. Um, and, and so I think that uh, we're probably far away away from that, you know, in the U.S., for example, uh, or other places. But, you know, depending on uh, people's reactions, I think that, uh, you know, there is this overarching feeling of like we've got to flatten that curve and, and kind of fight back against this. I would say there's a non-zero chance uh, some version of martial law comes to the U.S. as well in the next two, three weeks. I mean, if uh, if this thing continues to spread and people aren't uh, voluntarily uh, kind of isolating themselves, then it's it's definitely possible. I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me in the next two to three weeks, which sounds crazy yeah. for Americans, it's especially because a lot of Americans have guns. Well, so it's a little bit of a different... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I I, uh, I was explaining to somebody the other day, if you would have said four or five weeks ago, you know, hey, the stock market's going to go down 30 percent. There's the possibility of martial law, you know, all, all these different things. People would have looked at you like you were nuts. And in a very yeah. short period of time, um, you know, here we are. Yeah, exactly. And I think that uh, people could be in for a little bit more surprises in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's all hope not, and uh, hopefully we can hope get this for the best control and, and kind of get back to normal yep. life. Absolutely. Yep. Well, James, listen, I really appreciate you coming on on a such short notice and, and helping us understand this. Where can people find you uh, online and, and kind of find more about what uh, what you're tracking um, and paying attention to? Uh, James Tadaro MD is my Twitter account. It looks like uh, Joe just put it on the screen there. Uh, that's the best way to follow. Joe's a legend. Look at him, man. I know he's quick. That's where I talk about coronavirus updates. Uh, a lot of times it's effect on, on the Bitcoin cryptocurrency markets, and that's where I talk about all my crypto insights as well.